Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Welcome to Dinner Party Tonight. We have a full crew. Uh, instead of Hightow, we have Jordan. We finally broke 10.4 thousand Instagram followers, which is very exciting. Woohoo! Yay! Today we're going to be making some interesting sort of transition things from late summer to fall. We're going to make tomato jam, which I made for the first time for the big visit of my brother and his family. We serve it with cheese or whatever. It's like basically tomato relish. I don't know. It's just so good. Then we're going to make tomato tart uh, using Mark Bittman's flawless recipe and tomatoes from my garden. They may be ugly, but they sure taste good. Then we're going to make Rack of lamb. It's a lamb, you know, and it's silenced, if you know what I mean. Uh, but this is a very beautiful way to uh, serve a uh, rack of lamb. We're, we are going to use the sous vide, but uh, you can, I'll tell you how to do it without the sous vide. So let's go into a world of pure imagination. No vibrato, ever. I want to tell you guys about this amazing condiment. David found it, he claims. We both read about it in the same magazine at the same time. It's called Chili Crunch. I'm telling you, I just ordered three new jars. I went through three jars in like a second. They have no idea I'm saying this, but I just want to tell you, this is probably the greatest multi-use condiment on the planet. Put it on eggs and sandwiches. I might have it in my sandwich later. In fact, I definitely will. Chili Crunch. Let's make tomato jam. This is something you can keep it in your fridge for weeks. If you really want to can something, which will destroy your entire kitchen, you can can it and it'll last for a year. But uh, really it lasts for at least two weeks. The ingredients are tomatoes, curiously, um, ginger, sugar, lime juice, and I'm going to add a little bit of vinegar, which is not in the recipe. Because when I made it before, although it was very delicious, I think it needed a little more vinegar. Do you know what I mean, Reggie? Yes. And it has cumin also, which you might be like, cumin? Ew. But it really works in the recipe. And it's quite a lot of cumin, if I remember correctly. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut some shallots, which are also not in Mark Bittman's recipe. If we didn't have to move the camera, I would probably fry this a little bit before I put it in. But instead, I'm just going to cut it really thin. The good thing about this dish is that you basically just throw everything in the pot as you cut it, which is kind of awesome. And let's cut some tomatoes. These are from my garden. This tomato, it looks so ugly, I know. I swear to God, these taste like they are already have basil and salt. It's the most incredible thing on the planet. I'm going to cut it in half. Take a look at it cut off some of this weirdness. And then you're just going to kind of rough chop this because it's going to disintegrate in the pan. Okay. So you don't have to be too fancy pants about it. Did you guys see on Instagram David's icing of the cake? Holy crap. I want to talk about an ch amazing charity. So this guy, Jose Andres, who's a, or Andres, who's a very brilliant Spanish chef. He got upset about uh, how difficult it was to get food to people in Haiti. So he literally flew there on his own dime and opened up a kitchen to feed people who were displaced and unable to get food in Haiti. And uh, he started a charity called World Central Kitchen, which has a very good rating on Charity Navigator, where you can donate to just getting food to people. No red tape. You know, they just take the plane, they land, and they send the food out. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, let's see. How about a couple of these? These are cherry tomatoes. These are so good. I'm just going to cut those in half. Now I'm going to put some ginger in. Usually when I make something, the first time I make it, I will exactly follow the recipe. And then the second time you can do your own thing. That's enough ginger, right? A teaspoon of cumin, which is a lot of cumin, but trust, trust this part of the recipe. Now I'm going to put a chili in there. These are Thai chilies, also from my garden. 
and I'm going to show you a trick. Jalapeno, Thai, whatever. Roll it like this firmly between your hands and you're loosening the seeds because you don't want the seeds really. They're very hot and you want this to have a little bite, not a kick, right? And then when you cut the top, you can push the seeds out. See that? And you'll still have a couple of seeds in there, but it's much, much better than having 4,000 seeds. I'm cutting little teeny pieces of this, very nice. We grow a lot of chilies uh, in David's amazing garden. We make a hot pepper jelly, which I serve at uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. All right, that already looks beautiful. It looks delicious to me. I'm gonna put a little bit of cider in it. This is apple cider vinegar, just a little bit. Eh. And some sugar. Now they want you to put a cup of sugar in. I think that's a little bit sweet. But the problem is if you don't put enough sugar in, you're basically making tomato sauce. So I'm gonna put about six eighths of a cup in. And then you put this on the stove and reduce it until it turns into jam. I have an announcement to make. I went to Mr. Lee's yesterday to get Triscuits. He didn't have any Triscuits because the delivery was coming. And I bought something called Wheat Thins. Wheat Thins are disgusting. Don't buy Wheat Thins. You want this to be pretty rapid because it gets super liquid. I'm gonna put a little pepper in here too. A little bit of salt, I don't know. So I'm gonna kind of mix this around a little bit. Taste the liquid to make sure that it's okay. Ooh, that's really good. And then I'm just gonna bring this up to a super rapid boil, and then I'm gonna bring it down a little bit and reduce it. What's gonna happen is the tomatoes are gonna release a lot of liquid, and it takes a little time to reduce. So we're gonna boil this and reduce it. I forgot something. Two teaspoons of lime, which I completely forgot. It's actually sort of important. Ah. Now, it is a sort of a caramel, so you want to keep the sides, occasionally sort of run a tomato around the sides. Then reduce it for about an hour until it turns into jam, which I'll show you when it turns into jam. Tomato jam. I do it because I can. So last weekend, I had a double birthday weekend. It was Carrie Buster's birthday and Michael Birnbaum's birthday. Carrie wanted steak and corn and some other stuff. Michael wanted lamb, curry sort of, Middle Eastern -y lamb. So I did a couple of tests and uh, I wondered if you could cook lamb in a sous vide because lamb is so difficult to time. Now listen, you don't need, you don't need a sous vide. You can do it in the oven, okay? Uh, but I'm gonna use the sous vide, a uh, jewel sous vide, the, the one that doesn't have the, the metal. And uh, it, it's worth it. It's really worth it. It's a good kitchen gadget, um, which Reggie gave me for my birthday. So we're gonna make a rack of lamb with a slightly Middle Eastern flavor. Uh, you're gonna marinate this, but you don't really have to marinate it uh, in the vacuum bag for the sous vide. If you're not doing sous vide, you just paint this on it when it's resting in the fridge. Here's our silenced lamb, not making any noise anymore. I'm gonna cut this in half because we think uh, it might actually be better. Now it does have this is the end of the chine bone, I think, which I had problems cutting the lamb when we served it also. Yeah, you see that? That's a weirdness. There we go. So you never want to saw. I just sawed, but you don't want to saw. This is not sharp enough, that's why. All right, so there's two pieces. Uh, if you get this from your butcher, you want it to be Frenched, which is what this is called, which is pretty graphic. And they can do that, but if they do it for you, you have to remember to tip your And remember, you can do it once a year if you give a large tip with a bottle of something and they split it amongst the guys and girls. Um, but if they have a tip jar, you've got to tip them. I'm telling you, it makes a big difference. It really does. So I cut this into two totally different sizes. <laughs> Reason unknown. And I'm now going to uh, salt and pepper it. You can be pretty, pretty liberal with this, okay? 
So I'm going to salt and, and I'm going to put a little salt on the, the thing because when you turn it over, it sits back in salt. You can do this anytime. You can do this the day before. Pepper, Clarice, all the way to the FBI. The scariest part of that movie is when she's at the wrong door. Am I right? Did you scream in the theater? I did. Okay, I'm just sort of mopping up the excess salt and pepper. So this double birthday was a major cooking weekend. Um, and both had full desserts. Michael wanted make your own eaten mess. And Carrie wanted chocolate fleck cake. If you didn't look on Instagram, check out David's icing. It's amazing. You don't really want to put too much of this next thing on if you are sous vide -ing. Yogurt in a sous vide, a little weird, okay? But it, it was fine, but I would just use a little less. What I'm gonna do is use some plain yogurt. Uh, this is Greek yogurt. I'm gonna use about that much. I'm gonna make a little extra because I'm gonna use it when I sear it at the end, all right? But not in the sous vide. This is plain mild curry powder. Word of to the wise, make curry powder once in your life. You should know what's in it once in your life. So go and buy a bottle, look at the ingredients, buy those things and crush them in a mortar and pestle because it just teaches you more about what's a good store-bought powder, for instance, or what you might wanna add to the store-bought powder. Anyways, here we go, a little bit of curry. I'm gonna mix that in. You want it to be sort of orange. You're gonna put a very, very thin layer in your sous vide bag. Okay, so I'm just gonna literally tap this on. Just a little tiny bit. That's enough for the sous vide bag. Okay, now I'm just gonna vacuum seal this. You didn't rinse this, did you? Okay, sorry, I have to rinse this. Sort of dry it a little bit. And then what I'm gonna do is put it on here and like this. Does it make a difference? Probably not, but it looks pretty in the sous vide bag. Here's my food saver vacuum sealer. Vacuum sealer, because I don't have a vacuum sealer. This doesn't really make a vacuum, just FYI. I'm gonna go ahead and do se two separate bags. Try to get nothing on the top of the bag. Uh, uh. Now I'm gonna vacuum seal these. You're gonna make sure this is folded down in that little pocket. And of course, if it's liquid, you can't use this because it draws the liquid up and ruins the seal, which is why I need a chamber vacuum sealer. <laughs> but I don't have the room for it. Uh, okay, here we go. It's doing it. Here's the danger with the liquid. Look at that. Perfection Incorporated. Sorry, I just have to make sure this is okay. This is close, so I'm gonna turn it down. Second piece. Here we go. Don't get excited, but it's vacuuming. Don't get excited, but it's sealing. Don't get excited, but it's vacuuming, vacuuming. This can now go in your refrigerator overnight if you want. Uh, if you're cooking it uh, as the afternoon and you're cooking it for dinner, uh, you can leave it out of the fridge because it's vacuumed. And uh, that's it. You're basically ready to cook this. They say it's one 45 for medium rare, that's nacho. Um, it's extremely rare at 145 for one hour. The reality is it's probably 148 or 150. We're gonna try 149 today for one hour and see what happens. Uh, you're gonna sear it after, so it's it's good for it to be rare because it gives you more searing opportunity. You can sear it for longer. Um, but I'm gonna try it at a slightly higher temperature. I cannot believe that there's a temperature suggestion underneath how I served it this weekend. 
which would essentially be raw. So I don't know. I know lamb is meant to be served rare, but I can't imagine it being rarer than it was. Anyway, lamb, it's pretty silent. This is exactly perfect, okay? So I'm gonna turn this down. Now, when I draw my spoon through it, I can see the road for one second before it goes back. So it doesn't immediately fill that space. Also, slow bubbles. If the bubbles go, it means it's reduced. You have to be careful because this is right at the stage where it can go from this to over-reduced. I don't like to put this in the jar, even though I know the jars are heat proof. I get, it makes me nervous. So I usually let it cool on the, on the stove for, you know, until it's not nuclear. Cause I have this fear of like pouring it in and the, it exploding and the jam going in my face and shards of glass. Pss, ah, pss, ah, pss, I can't see like that's my, my, so I usually let it cool in the pan. <laughs> Make tomato jam because you can. And because it's a really good way to use up tomatoes if you have 400,000 tomatoes, like myself and Nicholas. Right, Nicholas? That's right. I moved to a smaller jar because it reduced uh, lower than I thought. I'm gonna put this in the jar because it's now cool. See the consistency? That's what you want. And then you just, when you have a cheese plate out or something, you just put this on the cheese tray with a, um, you know, a little butter knife or something. And they can put it on their cracker with cheese or with even a little piece of salami or it basically goes with everything. Always clean it before you send it. This is ready to be refrigerated. These are Weck jars. They're chic and cute. You use these little things, they're kind of old fashioned, which is cute. But then these just go in the fridge until you want to eat them. Seriously, two weeks, three weeks, they'll be fine. I made a huge quantity of this for Peter and it's gone. In a week and a half, it got eaten. Like this big a jar. Um, people like it. Tomato jam, because you can. Let's make tomato tart. This is another way to use up your 40,000 tomatoes, right, Nikki? That's right. Okay, so uh, we're gonna make a crust, which I made the practice one last night, I'm not gonna lie. And um, it has an interesting, an interesting uh, addition, which is cream cheese. I'm gonna put two cups of flour in here. Then I'm going to put in half a stick of cream cheese. This is how I did it last night, wondering, was I supposed to cut this? I didn't cut it, and it was totally fine. Now this is gonna make a mess. It's gonna poof out. You're gonna pulse this just a couple times. See, it poofed out. You're just cutting in the cream cheese, right? I'm gonna put some salt, quite a lot. And you could put herbs in here. You could put a little Onion in there. All right, now I'm going to take some butter that I threw in the freezer after I measured it. It's 10 tablespoons. And I'm gonna cut this butter and I'm hurrying because I don't want the butter to get warm. You don't have to be too precise, but it's the pieces should be fairly small. I'm just gonna basically sprinkle the butter in like this. Don't be afraid of doing this, you can do this. This is a very workable dough. I don't know, it's very easy to work with. Now watch it not roll out when I do it in front of you guys. Um, so now I'm just gonna pulse this, boop, 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 until I cut the butter in. Anybody can do this. Baking is really some basic rules, and then you can do it. It's not like, oh, don't, don't think of it that way. So you wanna see pebbles and some larger pieces. Exactly like that. Exactly perfect. Pebbles and pieces. That's the name of my new band. Pour in a little water. About that amount. 
and watch the magic. You may need more water, but you never know. Let it go a little bit. What's happening? What's happening? Look! Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Dough. So you just want it to be not too wet. It shouldn't stick on your fingers. Cut this in half with my hands, basically. Get a piece of saran wrap. Comme ça, voila. For my Canadian fans, I love my Canadian fans. So you wanna make it into a sort of a disc and close any like big cracks that you see, right? And then fold it like this, make a nice package, flip it over and smooth it out, smooth the edges. So this is for one, we're gonna make one large tart. We're actually making enough dough, mysteriously, for two large tarts. This should rest for uh, at least 30 minutes or uh, overnight. Smooth out any big cracks, foldy moldy, flip it over, make it look pretty. Currently that's vegan, interestingly. Oh no, because no. it has cream cheese, that's right. And butter. And butter. <laughs> it's totally not vegan. So uh, this whole recipe uh, is from the inimitable King Arthur flour, which is, they are so fabulous. First of all, you can write them questions and if it's during business hours, they literally write you back basically the same day, okay? And their advice is sterling. And also their products are sick and uh, their recipes are basically flawless. The spice cake, the lemon cake, this tart, bread, they're, they're, the, the no flour chocolate cake, which is really a big favorite. Anyways, these should rest in your fridge for a little bit. They're quite soft and they should be a little bit harder. <laughs> oh dear. I'm gonna be frank. I'm reading Middlemarch, okay? Now, I don't know if any of you guys out in the world have read Middlemarch. Has anybody in this room read Middlemarch? Okay. I would be interested in your comments, world. I mean, she's no uh, Virginia Woolf, but she's not far. <laughs> And very different from the Bronte similar period. But anyway, it's, um, it's, a, it's a difficult book. Here is a tart pan, which happens to have a removable bottom. If you wanna serve the tart without the sides, for instance, in a pan like this, or if you have a prettier thing, you don't have to take it out. You serve it out of the pan. But we're gonna use this one and we're gonna try to do this, okay? So by the magic of television, I happen to have a rested dough which should have been removed from the fridge about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> so here is the dough I made last night. My friend Madeline, who's 15, just saw Thelma and Louise for the first time. And there's a thing in Thelma and Louise that I think is so beautifully heartbreaking. There's a little moment where um, Susan Sarandon is putting on lipstick in her car and she looks in the side mirror and there's other women sort of sitting in their windows looking at her putting on the lipstick. Do you remember that moment? And she stops putting the lipstick on and looks at them. Okay, this is too hard because, ah, the sun came out and wrecked the shot. The sun came out and wrecked the shot. We fixed it. We said, Good morning, starshine. The earth says hello. You twinkle above us. We twinkle below. All right, here we go. Uh, don't use a lot of flour because then you have raw flour. So you wanna just kinda go like this. I know it makes a mess. You're gonna do like this. 12 o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, three o'clock, turn. You can do it any rhythm you want. Just keep turning it. The to everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn. Ah, oh, the birds, close harmony. And there was, who was in that? Not Graham Nash. Somebody from CSNY was in that band. David Crosby? David Crosby, there's a mystery there. Let's talk about that for a second. I wouldn't say he was the best looking guy on the planet, but apparently he had some kind of 
animal magnetism or something. Joni Mitchell was madly in love with him, which tells you a lot, because she's pretty smart. Two separate people chose him as the sperm donor for their babies. There's gotta be something about him that I don't know. Like Paul said, oh, you should look at pictures of him when he was a kid, right? Maybe he was super cute. He was cute, but he's not really handsome. I don't know how to explain it. There's gotta be something going on with David Crosby. I know other women agree with me. Why, why did Melissa Etheridge pick David Crosby? I think that's big enough, but I'm gonna check by doing this. This dough, look at how amazing this dough is. This is the hard part. Make sure it's pick it up and set it down if it's not, if it's not properly draped. I'm gonna take a little piece here and just add. Nobody knows what you did before you've made the thing. I'm pressing it into the indentations and then I'm not gonna trim it until it's cold. Okay, and then I'm gonna put this in the fridge like this for about 10 minutes really. But by the magic of television, I happen to have one right here. I'm gonna trim this with a sharp knife. Don't try to do too much at once. Just do little sections, okay? Peel those off. Jesus, that's perfect. So this is the excess. You could cut little designs to put on top with this if you want. You could make lattice, I guess, with it. I'm gonna put this back in the fridge while I make the filling. So, I just wanna say that as we're doing this, David Blaine is doing Ascension, which is when he's holding onto the balloons, he's actually about to land. I missed the takeoff. He's over the LZ. He flew at, I think, 27,000 feet with no mask. Uh, sort of like going to Everest with no mask. Go, David. Never forget Electrified, and I'll never forget the ice thing, and tomato tart, let's do it. So first of all, I think it's six eggs, but I'm not sure. Yes, six eggs. Two. You break them in the bowl, come ça. Three, four, five, six. This is six eggs beaten. About a cup of cheddar. Whoa, right? Milk. Uh, I'm putting in some dried herbs. Oh, it looks beautiful. Here's the tart. So I'm gonna get as much cheese as possible. I've never made this before, so we're having an experience like the lemon curd, which we all know now is way too thick, but that's okay. I'm gonna get the most beautiful slices I can get. Two, three, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm gonna put a little pepper on top. I'm gonna put this in a 425 oven, which is extremely hot and then you reduce it after a short time, it's probably to cook the eggs, to 350. So Regina, if you would be so kind as to open the door for me. Fifteen minutes, here we go. The recipe is on King Arthur flour. Read it carefully, it's got a little quirk in the writing, but it's uh, clearly a fl another flawless recipe. Here we go. Oh my God, look at her tart. Come on. Wow, look at that. Tomato tart. It's a really good start. Doesn't make you fart, but it might make you fart actually. What's that? Is it the Water Babies by Charles Kingsley? We're gonna sous vide this lamb at 148 for one hour. What that will do is give me a rare enough lamb that it, I can still sear it beautifully and not overcook it. So here we go, into the sous vide in this attractive bucket. Goodbye, little silent lamb. Goodbye, little silent lamb. I'm just pinning this really for no reason. It's not gonna slide in. It's completely submerged in the bucket. So this is uh, gonna be in here for one hour. I'm gonna set the timer. You can leave it in the water mysteriously for up to four hours following the cooking. Let's talk about that. I'm just gonna set the timer, hold on. So now it's gonna be ready in an hour. Uh, so explain this. 
you put this thing in the sous vide, you cook it, right? And it gets to 165. Now with chicken, with certain fish, you have to take it out. But let's say you're cooking chicken. You can leave it in the sous vide for two hours after it reaches the temperature and it will come out absolutely flawless. I can leave the lamb in here for four hours after the hour of cooking and it will come out exactly the same. Somebody freaking explain that to me. How does that work? But this is why they use it in restaurants, FYI, because you, it's flawless. So when I do my Christmas fillet, let's say, um, I, I don't have to be like this looking in the oven. Um, with lamb, rack of lamb, it cooks very quickly. Um, I'll get you the exact numbers in a minute, but I would cook it at pretty high heat, let's say 420, uh, maybe 450, but that might be too high for, I don't know guys, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, but I'll look it up. I haven't uh, done it in the oven in, in a while. I usually do it on the grill, in which case it's until it looks grilled. But it does cook very quickly, and if you look at it, um, the, the meat part is very small because it's a tiny baby animal. This has been sous vide away at 148 uh, for an hour. If this was a dinner party, I would have this somewhere where the audience couldn't hear the water babies. And uh, I'm now going to shut off the sous vide with my magic app. You don't have to wash this. It's amazing. Look, it's completely clean. It's just water. Ooh. And now I'm going to heat up a pan and sear the crap out of this. But first of all, I'm gonna take it out of here. Oh, you know what we should do? We should do something super chef-y. If you watch any cooking shows or you cook yourself at home a lot, you know that this is very convenient in your pan where you're making pickles or you're doing something very precise, you drain it on a J-cloth. So it's an English thing that I use. Maybe that will get me the MBE. I'm gonna cut these open and remove the rack of lamb. So the great thing about this is that I've purposefully given myself leeway to sear it. I'm now gonna sear this in Conrad. Bum, 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 my favorite pan. He's my pan, he's the man. Conrad, the pan. Now you want this to be ripping hot and it makes a horrendous mess. So if you have a grill or even a hibachi thing that you can put outside and put the pan on that so that you don't um, destroy your kitchen. You want to use a hot pan. Grapeseed oil. Correct. Grape bola, which is like some kind of gambling game or something, right? Step right up for the grape bola. You wanna put in enough so that you have a complete surface, which I'm going to enhance by doing this. Here's the lamb. I'm gonna take this off, the, the mint off, because it's just gonna burn. Uh, presentation side down, unless the other side looks better when you serve it. Could be hotter. <laughs> Nick says, I always say that. Let this sear and you can move it to get an even sear if it moves. If it sticks, don't move it. Pretty, pretty good. So a little bit of the marinade. Basically just curry flavor. So I'm sort of doing this for appearances, okay? You know? called real-time cooking. So this should be fairly quick, like I'm almost done. And then at the very end, you can throw in a little bit of butter, which will uh, give you a nice brown color, and then move it around in that. Okay. You wanna rest this for just a little bit. And just super gently tent it. Don't, don't wrap the paper around it and let it sit for a couple, you know, five, 10 minutes, okay? Then uh, you can serve. You can also render it a little more on the grill, 
or if it's not causing a smoke condition in your home, you can render it a little bit on a lower heat after you sear it. Lamb. You can try it in the sous vide or not. It's a special, special, special thing for some people really love it. So lamb, it's a grand slam. So today we made a beautiful, silky, unctuous, gastrique of tomatoes, a tomato jam. We made a tomato tart. What to do with your extra tomatoes? Question mark. Answered. And we also made a beautiful sous vide lamb, a special grand slam lamb. Bam. Leonard and I want to say thanks for watching Dinner Party Tonight. We would be lost without you guys. Your questions, your comments, your suggestions for things to make. For instance, more vegetarian dishes, which are coming down the pike, as well as a possible Christmas surprise. Who knows which way the wind blows. Whoosh. Leonard, ah, he's getting old. And I was gonna show you guys me shoving the pill down his throat. But we decided not to.